All right, um, I guess we'll get started. Um, ignore the background noise. Um, so let's see. Um, I guess today we're gonna continue on with these sequence models. Um, I realize that, you know, the homework is a little bit different from what I'm talking about. Um, so, I have a feeling um, we're just going to extend the deadline. So at least, you know, next week I would talk about neural networks and the sort of the, the meat of the homework. So then you can actually do the homework. Um, so yeah, otherwise I haven't actually talked about neural networks or back propagation or whatever. Um, so yeah, so for now, um, we're just going to continue on with uh, the sequence models. Um, so today we're going to talk about recurrent neural networks, um, probably LSTMs, and uh, depending on how much time we have, maybe something more. Um, okay. So let's sort of just recap um, these hidden Markov models, uh, just at a high level. Um, I sort of went through them. Uh, we sort of talked about a bunch of the different models. And um, you know, sometimes I sort of forget to mention some high level stuff here. Um, so let me just draw some diagrams, right? So let's have some graphical models. Uh, the last one we were looking at was something along these lines where you have your xt, xt plus one, your wt's, wt plus one, right? So um, what we're doing here is we're basically, you have some sequence, right? Uh, the WTs could be words, uh, could be anything. And you're trying to basically build a model to predict or to assign likelihoods to these words, right? Um, and so one way you can do this is through a hidden Markov model, right? Where you're basically, setting up basically like a probabilistic model, like a really fancy probabilistic model, where for instance, you know, you have this sort of bit like a recurrence relation between all the variables, right? Um, okay, so, so this is just, you know, so here I've, all I've done, it's a bit like when I do the topic models, I, all I've done is just describe a model for my data, right? Um, key points being as this is sort of the observed and this is hidden, right? So this is why it's called hidden. Um, and you have the sort of the relationship is going in the hidden variable layer, so to speak, right? But ultimately this is just a model, right? Um, what am I trying to do with this model? Uh, I'm basically, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out what these parameters are, right? Uh, so th this is a model, you know, it's like any other statistical model, uh, you have some parameters and you're trying to learn those parameters, right? So what is the intuition here? Um, you know, so the XTs 
one way you can think about them is sort of like the latent variables that sort of describe maybe the position, sort of the, the current context of the sentence, right? Um, and how do I get to output a word? Well, it's going to be, it's going to be a noisy version of, um, well, okay, so, so, so W being a word is not great because here I've, here both my X's and W's are normals, right? So that's not a good example, but okay. So in the common filter example, the W's is some uh, vector, right? Um, so there is some noisy version of the vector. Uh, oftentimes B is just identity matrix, okay? Um, but, you know, so, the reason why we bring this up is just really we want you to sort of pay attention to this this sort of phenomenon at the top here, right? You see that basically the XTs are the things that sort of are sort of depending on each other, right? It's it's somehow another way you can think about it is like sort of the memory, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. It's sort of like the memory of your uh, of the sequence, right? So in your memory, and then sort of within your, so you, you keep stuff stored hidden, right? In your memory, no one sees your memory. And then things come out like the words you say. So for instance, for instance, okay. Um, and so what we'll see is that recurrent neural networks are sort of, they have a similar structure in the sense that you have this sort of hidden layer that basically sort of, you know, is recurrent in its relationship. Uh, and then you use those hidden hidden information to then output something. Okay. Um, I actually don't particularly like the sort of this these these two slides that we have here. Um, I think it's actually sort of confusing. So I'm not going to go through them right now. And maybe later on when we sort of explain how recurrent neural networks, networks work, uh, then you can sort of see. Yeah, it's we're sort of this is like fitting something a little bit extreme. Um, I, I don't think these are. It's 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 not very clean this uh, this relationship. So. I think the sort of the takeaway from the hidden market models is that you basically have this uh, this latent variable, that is basically that has a really current relationship, and that's what we're going to see appears when you look at recurrent neural networks. As well. Okay, um, so. We're going to dive straight into recurrent neural networks, uh, and then I will probably take a step back at some point and show you how they they look a little bit like hidden Markov models. Okay, so a lot of this is taken from uh, this blog, which is the URLs at the top. Uh, it's a really well described uh, expository article about recurrent neural networks. So. This is basically what a recurrent neural network is, right? So let's work through this. So the, the data set here is gonna, it's gonna be a character level recurrent neural network. What that means is, you know, instead of words, I'm gonna represent everything. I, I'm gonna care about characters. So I wanna predict the next character here as opposed to predict the next word. So for now, it's just easier to do with this. And so what I'm gonna do, let's first look at this guy here, right? So this is our input data, right? Um, but we're gonna look at this one at a time, okay? Uh, so the first thing is that this is basically going to be a, well, let's make this red. This is basically a one hot encoding. Okay, so in particular, the characters are like that, right? So this is a four, so suppose I have a very small data set. I only have four characters, H, E, L, and O, right? So the first thing I do, I have my input uh, and it's, I'm gonna represent my input as a, in its one hot in, in encoding form, okay? So XT or XT minus one is this vector one, zero, 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 okay? Um, then what I have is I have this hidden layer, right? Sorry, give me a second. Um, uh, 
Okay, so then here I have is this hidden layer and I'm gonna explain how this works. Um, but this is basically sort of, you can think of it as a proxy of like the, the sort of the latent variable layer that we had in the hidden variable model, okay? Um, there's gonna be a relationship between HTs and XTs and eventually what comes out of the recurrent neural network is going to be this YT here, right? Um, so yt is going to be sort of a score for each particular character in my one hot encoding, right? So remember we had h, e, l, and o. So what this is basically saying is that for a given input h, right, what do I expect the next character to be? My current, um, my current prediction this is sort of the pre softmax layer is that I expect uh, the highest number is, you know, so I expect zero, uh, O with the highest probability probably. And then, well, let me just, uh, yeah. So, so O is the high probability uh, and then E is the next highest and then H and then L, right? So intuitively what this is just, this is, you know, this is basically a, you know, it's it, anytime you do some type of uh, classification, you know, anytime you have data where your final output is you know, some classification, uh, some categorical data, it's a bit like a legitimacy regression here. So basically these are the, the, the scores um, and then you're gonna take a soft max to actually get you the probabilities, right? Uh, okay, so how do we, how does this actually relate to each other? Basically what you have is you have this formula. Okay, it's sort of helpful to have both in the same term. Um, okay, let me just put it like that, All right? So let's see. So XT is my one hot encoding for my data, right? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit it with a matrix W, right? So this is parameters. And then I'm gonna hit my HT minus one. So HT minus one would be the previous version, right? So HT minus one would be here. These, these would be some numbers, you know, let's say minus, minus 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, for instance, right? So I'm gonna hit that with another matrix. So this is another parameter. And then I'm gonna do this nonlinear transform, right? So that gives me my HT. So HT would be this guy here, right? So this is HT, okay? Then once I add HT, what do I do? I then hit it with another matrix, WHY. So this is another parameter. And that gives me my YT, okay? And then finally, this is the whole softmax layer, right? So I basically apply the softmax function, which you've seen a few times now. So, uh, you know, say the exponential of that divided by the sum of the exponentials of everything. Okay, so, so, okay, so what is that? Basically the, here, what I'm looking at is a model for my data, right? So here is a model and then given this particular output yt, I have a, you know, a, a probability distribution over my characters. Okay. Does this make sense so far? Any questions? Does everyone, everyone sees this? Yeah, okay. Okay, so there's a few few things to note here that is sort of weird about recurrent neural networks is that the way this works is you're going to be predicting like, okay, so so it's, it's like with, oh, sorry. Uh, could you explain why HT only has three rows? Um, so HT can have as many rows as you want, right? So if you think about what's going on here, um, you, 
essentially, you know, let's see if we could. So, yeah, so XT can have four rows, and then HT can have as many rows as you want. You could have more rows, you could have less rows. That basically is defined the, what is it? The, uh, the size of this is going to be a function of my WHH and my WXH, right? So here actually it's an important point, which is that how big do you want your HT to be depends on how sort of complicated you want your model to be, right? Because intuitively, what is HT? HT is basically like your sort of your current, it, it, it's like a place where you can put, you can store information. So it's, it's, like, it's like your memory layer. And the reason why it's like a memory layer is exactly, is precisely because of the fact that these things sort of get passed down the, down the line, right? So if you remember here, when I'm predicting, so, 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 so I'm, I'm at uh, my in, input character is H, right? And I want to predict the next word to be E, right? Because obviously I'm trying to learn the, the word hello, right? But in order to predict H, not only do I use H, right? So here would, would be H. I'm also going to use the previous data that I had, right? And that comes in through the HT minus one, right? So, and every time you predict, every time you're predicting a new character, you're looking at the previous hidden layer as part of your input. So usually what usually what you know we'll show you some examples where basically HT, it actually sort of some of the uh, some of the elements of HT correspond in some you know rough way to some intuition about you know what you're trying to predict when you're doing these characters, character prediction. Okay, so yeah, so it shouldn't be the case that all of these have the same uh, dimension, right? Basically, what's controlling it? You basically define actually this uh, the size of H. Okay, um, okay. So this seems like it's sort of complicated because what's going on is like I. It looks like I have like four things going on, right? But actually, all I have is this one uh, sort of neural network and it actually just sort of recurses on itself. So what do I mean by that? Basically what's happening is, so okay, so I'm at H, I'm trying to predict the word E, the letter E, sorry, right? And then here, you know, you can see that, okay, let me, in, in the current state of the model, right? What does the current state of the model mean? That just means the current set of parameters, W, H, Y, W, X, H, W, H, H, right? A recurrent neural network is defined precisely just from these three parameters, right? So once I've defined these three parameters, I have a working model, right? So in the current state of the model, if I input H, then my output layer is gonna look like that, which is basically saying, well, I, I sh with the highest probability of prediction, I'm gonna predict the letter O, okay? So clearly that's gonna be wrong, blah, 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 that's fine. Um, so then you can, you, you can learn, you can think about how to train the model. But then what's gonna happen is you're then gonna to go to the next step where now you take your, your E and your E becomes the next input, right? because you're gonna go through this data one character at a time, okay? Right, okay, so let, let me talk about actually how intuitively once you get to this input, you're gonna change your, your, your data, right? So once you're at H, you should, your model should predict E, right? So it's not predicting, well, it is predicting E with some probability, but it's not predicting E with the highest probability. And because when you maximize your loss, you want to maximize having, you wanna have the highest number here versus, you know, in this case, you have the, the highest number at, at, at O. So in truth, what, what's gonna happen is you're going to basically tweak your parameters, right? So remember, what are the parameters? The parameters are these three parameters. Right, so intuitively, I want to tweak my parameters in such a way that this number is going to increase. 
and these three numbers are going to decrease, right? So you know that sort of makes sense, right? How, the whole point of the whole point of training your model is that you want it to match the data that you see. So at some high level, what's going to happen is you're going to train your model in such a way that this 2.2, you know, maybe gets to a high number, and the other ones get to lower numbers. Right. Um, okay. And then what you do is then you then move on to the next character, right? So then I'm on to E and I just basically repeat the same process. So I have my uh, input layer, which is the one hot encoding, right? So this is my one hot encoding of E. And now it's the exact same recurrent neural network, right? What is the recurrent neural network? It's basically three parameters, right? So I have these three parameters to get from E to my prediction for the next character, I hit this with this matrix. I hit the hidden layer from my previous character with this WHH, and I get this new hidden layer that corresponds to this input. And you know, so that corresponds to this point, right? And then I do an output again. And my output here is, Sorry, let's just keep track of what's what, H, E, L, and O. So clearly, again, my model is not particularly good because I should be predicting L, but this is the, the smallest score for my output layer, right? So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna then update my parameters such that this guy gets increased and this guy gets decreased and these three, these three basically get decreased, okay? Um, so, so that's sort of, you know, so here it's sort of very different from usually what we're dealing with when we have some, a bunch of data, right? This has to be a sequential model and it's a sequential model simply because you have this HT factor, right? In order to fit, you know, in order to fit this next character, I need to have done this whole thing before. So this HT is, is you know, obviously very, very important, right? So in order to actually run through my model and actually predict words, I have to actually sort of do it sequentially. And so this is why it's a sequential model, okay? So let's think about, okay, so, so suppose I have this model here. Let's think about how this actually generates data, right? Okay, maybe it's better if I go to a, to a cleaner one, okay? So how's this gonna generate data is in the following way. So in this particular case, you're actually going to not have the answers, right? So suppose I wanna, you know, suppose I fitted my recurrent neural network and I wanna generate data. How's this work? I start with, let's just say I, I, I start with some initial character and I start with H just to make it easy, right? So I have H, right? I have my input layer. This is this is my X1, basically. I hit it with my WXH. Um, I have a hidden, I have a hidden layer, but there's no actually start. So maybe I can just like initialize to whatever I want. Um, and this is gonna give me a hidden layer, which then creates an output layer, right? From the output layer, I'm then going to basically have a probability distribution over my characters, right? So then what I would do is I would just sample from this probability distribution. And let's say I sampled O, right? So I've sampled O from this probability distribution. And then this then just becomes my input to my recurrent neural network, right? So then I go through the same motions again. I now have O. So that would be in this position. I, I don't know, I hit it with a matrix. I look at the previous hidden layer, I put it there, and then I basically get a new hidden layer. This produces an output Y2. And then this gives me a distribution over all the characters. And so I, you know, I basically sample from this distribution again, it's a multinomial distribution over my characters. And let's say this gets me an O again, right? And so I just basically repeat this. So this is 
this is very different from most stuff that we've seen, right? Because here you're doing, well, okay, sorry, most stuff that we've seen in terms of like logistic regression or something like that, right? Here, you're, it has to be sequential in nature and it's sequential in nature precisely because we want to deal with data that's sequential. Um, so so this, this type of architecture allows you to handle these types of sequential data where, you know, you want to, you know, it's like with the language model, right? So the whole, whole point of language model is that you want to, you want to be pretty, you know, want to be constructing words that are, you know, dependent on the previous words that you have. And here the dependency comes in precisely through this hidden layer, which you can sort of think of it as like a, a memory storage. Any questions? Does that make sense? Have I lost everyone at this point? Okay, so question is, what is the point of a model that takes one character as an input and generates a sequence of predictions based on those predictions? Um, no, yeah, no, 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 no. So, 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 good question. Uh, so, actually, what you're describing is something else, and I will actually get to that. Um, this is not that. Uh, it looks a bit. It looks sort of like it. Um, well, hmm. uh, okay. Let me think about this. Um, so, for instance, if you had the language model, right? If you think about the sort of the, I, I, th I think I went through these examples uh, in class, right? Um, where you can sort of, you know, show actually creations of like, you know, essays written by the, these computers or AIs. That's exactly the same thing, right? Because what is a language model? It's, I give you, I can give you, I can start, I have a seed sentence. I could give you some, you know, initial value to start my, you know, uh, my, my, my text on. But ultimately what I'm doing after that is I'm just basically drawing words from my language model, right? So intuitively, you could just give it one word, right? I, or you could just give it no words, right? You could just basically let it um, sample from, you know, your, your uh, non-conditioned probability of how the word, like which word is most likely, right? But ultimately that is what, that is that, that exactly what a language model is. It's basically, it's basically a way to form a sequence, you know, over time. And that's one way you could you could use it, right? Obviously, we use it in different ways. We use a language model to basically, given a piece of text, I want to describe the likelihood of that. Sorry, given a, a string of words, I want to describe the likelihood of that string of words. So then I could use it for like you know, um, speech recognition and stuff like that. But in that, you know, in the examples that we see with the New Yorker, that's really what you're doing, right? You're I give you. Um, you know, Steven Pinker, the first few words of his sentences, right? And then I just start generating from that language model in the same way. So here, this is the same thing, right? Here, I can give you a, you know, a seed word, but ultimately what this is doing, and this is basically a way to capture the, uh, the likelihoods. Well, okay, so it's not really, it, it's, yeah, it's a little bit like capturing the likelihoods, uh, but it's, it's not as direct as with a language model. Um, okay, well, so many questions. Uh, if you're generating data, how do you know what the target characters are for backpropagation? Um, so I haven't talked about backpropagation. Um, so, okay, so, so what I'm describing here is basically like once you've set up your model, you're, once you've trained your model, right? So the thing I talked about before was like training my model, right? I have some training text and I blah, 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 blah. Well, then I finished training, what do I do? I can then actually generate data, right? And so we'll show you examples where you're generating data. But the, the, the point of this is that 
this is just one way you can sort of look at the output of a recurring neural network. And this is this is one output of a recurring neural network, right? It's a, it's a it's a it's something to generate sequences, right? The the backprop that is what happens at the training stage, right? That's where I have, you know, a sequence of characters, and I want to learn how to, uh, you know, tweak my parameter in such a way that it's going to maximize the loss that I'm going to define. Um, the reason why I don't go into actually how do you actually calculate these things is because it's a little bit annoying because you have to, you know, the backpropagation is not as straightforward here. Um, again, so for those who don't know what backpropagation is, we could talk about it next week. Um, essentially, it's the, the, uh, the formalization of what, what I say when I say like, you know, here we have my output layer and I have my, uh, my parameters and I wanna move those parameters in such a way that they increase the loss, they, they decrease the loss um, of the training text. Okay, uh, so another question, given a sequence of characters C1, C2, if we wanna predict character CN, does the hidden layer just encode information about the first N characters through the recurrence? Um, yes, you can sort of think of it like that. Um, right, so what, so, 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 okay, so first of all, what's really important here to remember, um, and it's, it's, it's not that obvious, um, this is called sort of, it's, it's called the unrolled version of an RNN, right? Because it looks like what's happening is you have like, you know, a bunch of WHs and they sort of change depending on where you are in your sequence, right? Okay, maybe it doesn't, you know, but like it might seem like that's the case, but actually what, right? So the key point here is that there are literally only three parameters and they never change. Sorry, as in, those are the parameters you're trying to learn, but they don't change across the sequence. They all, I mean, they only change because I'm when I train them, I need to you know, tr train them across my sequence. But this is why I gave you the example of when I'm generating actual data from my, uh, from my recurrent neural network, these parameters are literally fixed, right? So these WHHs are fixed throughout my whole sequence that I'm generating. You know, I can keep generating the sequence forever, so ideally what the WHH is trying to do is, is sort of saying like, okay, it's, uh, it's maybe like telling what to keep and what not to keep across these hidden layers, right? So the hidden, the hidden layer, the information within each layer, right? So the numbers within these green blocks, those are like your memory, right? And obviously this memory is gonna change, right? So it's like, so, you know, example that people like to give is like when you're constructing sentences, if you start the word, if you start the sentence with like she, blah, 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 blah. So then you know that the gender of the subject is gonna be female. Then you might, you hope that the hidden layer will sort of contain that information and store it there, right? So, you know, somewhere in my hidden layer, something, there's, inf there's a piece of information stored that the subject is she. Right, and then as you go forward, you keep going. Then at some point, if you use a you know if you use a word that requires the, to use a the gender, then it's going to take that piece of information and actually use it, right? And then at some point, you might want to drop it because you know maybe there's a new sentence or maybe you've you know changed the topic or something. So then, ideally, your WHH should know when to drop that piece of information. Right. Um, okay, so this is a very hand wavy. I mean, we'll, we'll see some examples about how, like, like what some hidden, what like what some of these numbers actually you know look like. Um, but the key point here is that it's like it's not, it's not changing. The the WHHs aren't changing. The hidden layers themselves uh, are changing. And yeah, so in this in your example. 
about you know whether well what kind of information is it encoding you could sort of say yeah it is sort of just encoding something relevant about uh these first n characters but in particular sort of the, i mean the idea is you want to store information that's useful for prediction right um right if if you're if if you're if if your training data is just words that is generated from, let's say like a bigram model, right? So in the sense, like if the next word only depends on the previous word, then I don't really need to use my hidden layer so much because I don't need to you know, store information over time, right? My hidden layer is only gonna be useful in as much as it helps me to predict the words, right? So that means you know, it, when I'm training this, ideally it should be training in such a way that it's gonna learn to store information in this that's useful such that you know later on I can I can take advantage of this information when I'm making future predictions. Okay, now <laughs> last question. Uh, why do we sample from the output layer distribution instead of picking the word with the highest probability? So yeah, so good question. Um, you can actually do that. Um, and people do do that. Uh, so here I wanted to, here I wanted to sort of make it more of a multinomial because you know it, it really is a multinomial um, in the sense of like you know we have a probability distribution, um, and so generally you sort of like to have it be a little bit random, right? So then if you, you know, if you run your language models a few times, you can see like different examples, right? So generally speaking, it's sort of nicer to instead of like you know picking the argmax. Uh, you just pick, you know, actually just sample from it. The other reason is because, you know, if, if you just pick the arg max, then maybe some, you know, maybe these probabilities are so close to each other that it's unfair that one of them is just higher by a little bit, right? Yeah, but ultimately, that, that, that depends on your, your use case. Um, if, if you care about generating sequences of things that are, you know, fixed or constant, uh, then maybe you'll pick an arg max. But I mean, they're both fine. Okay. So, okay. So let's go back and look at this. Uh, maybe I want to get rid of all this stuff. So this equation, this set of equations are, is synonymous is equivalent to this graph, right? Um, and it, it, it's sort of hard to see that in a little bit, um, but basically these things are the same thing. Essentially, my recurrent neural network is just this, right? Um, so, you know, because I'm drawing it in this way, it can get a little bit complicated, but I think it's important to, to show that actually, you know, the way this works is that it's sort of feeding off each other as you sort of go through my sequence. But but in, in terms of the actual like relationships between each other, then it's just it's just this, right? So what we have is we have this multinomial. Um, you know, we have so we have our input, we have the previous hidden layer, and this is you know, this is just some linear combination. Uh, my nonlinear transform, and then I'm hit it with another matrix, and then basically. I'm done, All right? So really the only sort of crucial piece of insight that makes this different from everything else is just this HT minus one, right? And what is this HT minus one? This is basically this, you know, I mean, it's not the same thing. It's, it's similar in spirit to the whole hidden Markov model thing, right? Um, right, so, you know, this is sort of one way you can sort of look at this, right? So um, now, you know, your HTs are the hidden things and your WTs are the observed things. Um, you know, HT, H's, HTs are no longer random variables. So it's sort of, it's not that great to write this in terms of like graphical structure, but the key point is that it's, you know, here you having this recurrence relationship, um, 
here, but all, actually in this particular, in the recurrent neural network case, it actually also depends on your uh, Ws as well. Um, okay, so don't read into this graphical structure too much. Essentially, I wanted to show you some, you know, it, it's a little bit like the hidden Markov model, um, you know, where the hidden Markov model, I have my XTs and they're uh, hidden and then they produce WTs. Here with the recurrent neural network, um, sort of everything relates to each other, but there's this recurrence relationship in the background. Okay. Okay, so, you know, as I said, the actual code itself, I mean, so the actual function itself is pretty straightforward, right? So it's just these three lines. Um, what does that translate to? That translates to having actually code that is pretty straightforward too, okay? Because what you have is you have your X, that's your input, right? I'm gonna hit it with XH, with WXH, and then I'm gonna have WHH, Right, and that gives me my hidden state, right? And then I hit it with WHY, and that gives me my Y, right? So, you know, there's basically just two lines here, right? For the actual, you know, running of this recurrent neural network, right? Uh, you know, here I'm dealing with Python code. Uh, you know, it, the point of this is just to show that it's, it's fairly straightforward. You know, it's not particularly complicated. Um, what you can do is that in this particular case, I have one hidden layer, right? So there's only one hidden layer, which my HT, I remember the HT corresponds to this line here, right? Um, and then I hit it with another HY, but there's no reason why you can, you know, you have to restrict yourself to one hidden layer, right? So one of the things that, you know, I, I wish we had, I wish we could spend more time on, well, I don't, I don't know if I, we don't cover a lot of stuff about uh, neural networks. Um, and so we don't really get to see this very well. But one of the things about neural networks is that it's basically like Lego bricks in the sense like you basically have these layers or particular sort of interesting uh, architectures and you can just basically build them on top of each other, right? So here, what you have is a recurrent neural network. You can basically just, you know, put one on top of each other, whoops. Right, so, so how does that work? I have my input X, this then basically goes through the motions to create a Y, right? But my Y doesn't have to be my final output. My Y can then be the input of my of my next recurrent neural network, right? You know, so you know maybe you might ask, well, you know, what's the point of it? Just in general, you're just introducing more parameters. Now you have sort of like two sort of memories going across, right? So maybe it's a little bit better. But no, there's not, there's nothing stopping you from sort of you know adding layers upon layers, right? Uh, and oftentimes what you, what you find is that actually adding layers actually helps uh, because it's sort of increasing the complexity of the model uh, without too much computational cost. Okay, so, you know, this, this, is, so, this is just saying that recurrent neural networks, because it, essentially they're, they're very simple. They're just basically, you know, hitting, hitting your inputs with, uh, uh, with matrices and also having a hidden layer that sort of, you know, is recurrent, um, you can basically, you know, append, you can basically add multiple recurrent neural network layers one on top of each other if you want to. Okay. So this is, um, wait, wait, first of all, are there any other questions? Okay, uh, if not, um, the other nice thing about recurrent networks, so one thing you can do is you can stack them on top of each other. Um, 
that's that's just making your model a little bit more complicated. But the really nice thing about recurrent neural networks, and the reason why we sort of talk about them in this in this context is because of the fact you know this this whole area that we've been discussing is the idea of like sequence data, right? Sequential data. So this is very different from you know linear regression from any type of you know, random forest stuff, boosting stuff that we've talked about, I guess even eh, topic models a little bit. Um, but the key point here is that because of this really um, flexible structure of your recurrent neural network, you're able to actually handle data, which is a little bit different from what you might expect, right? So, so the classical example is you have some input X and you wanna predict Y, right? So each of X then predicts Y. There's the, you know, so that's why you have these training pairs of X and Y, right? You don't, there's no relationship between them. So you're just basically done, All right? So I have X and Y that generates X, Y pairs, okay? So sometimes maybe I'll have one input X and then I actually want to generate multiple Ys. Let's say Y, uh, say Y, yeah, Y1. Y2, Y3, All right? So what does that mean? That's for each data point X, I have actually like a, a tuple, a Y1, Y2, Y3. Um, oh, sorry, there is, there is a question. Uh, okay, so while I read this question, think about examples of this form. Uh, I'm confused. Uh, okay, so uh, any, does anyone have any examples of this type of data? Anyone want to think of any examples? I feel like there probably are any examples. Okay, I mean, it, it's sort of a silly question. Um, Okay, so what if X was an image? So I know we haven't talked about images, but what if X was an image? What could what what could my Y output be potentially? Red, green, blue values. Um, no, uh, no. So okay, sorry. I'm okay. I'm sort of, so here X is the image itself, right? So that would be the, like the vector representation, which would um, be the actual, you know, it, it could be colored, right? So, so it would just be the red, green, blue values of it. Um, yeah, so one example for this could be, you know, in an image, you could have multiple, you know, objects in your image, right? Although here it's, a it's not, you know, it's not sequential, so it doesn't really work like that. Um, the the sort of the, the classic example here is, is a caption, right? Because, you know, there I'm generating text and that's sequential in nature, right? So here my X is an, an image, right? You know, I can, you know, I can push, I can squeeze my image down into a really, really long vector, N by N, uh, well, one times N by N, right? So that's a really long vector. And my output should be a sentence describing that image, right? So you can use, well, so I haven't sort of described how you can use recurrent neural networks, but you know, the, the architecture looks a bit like that, right? The, the green things are the hidden units and they produce uh, the output and so on and so forth. So you, could, you, could, you can set up your recurrent neural networks in such a way that actually it only takes one input and then it just generates outputs just through the hidden layers themselves, right? So this is, you know, this is, it's really, it's, it's very flexible, this type of architecture. Um, and it's very different from all, most other types of architectures you see in, uh, when you learn neural networks, you know, convolutional neural networks, just typical neural networks. Um, you could also have many to one, uh, you know, you can spend time thinking about that. 
the, the, the fun example, sort of the more fun example is this many to many. Um, and the classic example here is basically I want to translate uh, a sequence, right? Right, sorry, I, I lagged there a little bit. Uh, you know, translate a phrase from English, you know, English phrase to Chinese phrase, right? Um, so I picked Chinese phrase, you know, not, well, not just because I'm Chinese, but also in particular because there is usually there's not a one-to-one -one characterization of the length of a Chinese phrase and an English phrase, right? So these things are nice because they're flexible in terms of the output, the input length sequence and the output length sequence, right? So the way this many-to-many -many type thing would work is that you basically, you know, you feed in your English phrase and then really what's gonna happen, I'm, you know, so maybe I'll spend some time going, talking about this in a little bit. Um, oh, wow, I don't have much time either. <laughs> uh, where does the time go? Um, okay, let, let me talk, go through that. But basically this is a nice application of recurrent networks because I can basically deal with different sized input and output uh, sequences. Okay. Um, and so then, you know, this was the example of more like the many to many where we're just doing something like predicting language. Or, I mean, you can come up with other examples where you have videos and you want to be doing, you know, captioning for your videos, um, so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. So, sorry. So there was a question before, which is, is it ever the case that hidden layers are adjacent to one another in the graphical sense, i.e. you hit a WHH1 directly with a WHH2. Um, so, yeah, so you can do that. Uh, so I think what you're saying is like, for instance, you know, you, you know, so here in this two hidden layer setup, what I have is I actually, you know, I, you know, I do this one, I do this two, and I do this three, and I do this four, basically. Um, so maybe you end up just saying, you know, I do one, I do two again, and I do a three. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that's, I, I think it's fine. Um, generally speaking, you like the recurrent neural network is like a the recurrent neural network layer is both this step and this step. Um, so you rarely ever see like that, but I, you know, I actually, I, like, I don't particularly remember why um, this might matter so much. Um, yeah, I think it's fine to actually, you know, sort of skip sort of condensing everything into a Y um, because basically, you know, you're basically hitting it with a W H Y and, you know, you can probably skip that step as well if you wanted to. Um, so I don't think that matters too much. No. Okay. So any other questions? Oh, right. Oh, we do end up 50. So I, okay. So, so I, so I do have some time. Uh, not too bad. Okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, I haven't actually described how, um, how each of these sort of fit in to a recurrent neural network. Um, you know, th there's some technical details about like how you'd actually implement these things. Um, but really, it, you know, it doesn't, you know, intuitively it's sort of roughly the same as what you have with a simple recurrent neural network. Um, you just have to be a little bit, you have to think a little bit more carefully about how you would, you know, set this up, for instance. Okay. All right, so I wanna go through some examples because uh, I think this will help elucidate actually what's going on. Um, yeah, this example is not that fun. 
Okay, so so what what's happening is, um, actually, I've forgotten. Damn, I've forgotten which data set this was. Um, for this particular example, um, but what we're showing here is that you know, you're you have some corpus of data, right? And I haven't I haven't you know I've sort of hinted at how you would train this, right? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna literally run through my data, right? And then as I'm running through it, I'm gonna update. I'm gonna update my parameters such that it sort of fits the data that you see, right? And so as I run, as I do this, or I train this more and more and more, the output, you know, okay, once I finish training, you know, for, you know, 10 minutes, I'm gonna actually do what I said when I'm gonna generate data from my model, right? So this is, this is showing you that what happens when I generate data. And then the more I train, clearly the better my, my model is gonna be. And so finally, at the end of it, I can actually produce, you know, some text that actually is pretty reasonable. Okay, so it turns out actually that this, you know, this example is not particularly great um, because you can actually do almost as well as this, for instance, with like a bigram model. Uh, well, maybe not bigram, like a trigram model. Um, so this is not a good, actually, a good example of sort of the why recurrent neural networks, neural networks work really well. Um, you know, so hallucinated Wikipedia, I guess is a little bit of, of a better example. And the reason why it's a bit of a better example is because, yeah, it's not too much better, but sort of like the key things to note is that you wanted to be able to remember sort of information from before, right? So the, you, here we're dealing with character level, um, uh, models, right? So, so we're treating everything as a character as opposed to words, right? And so, if you think about what's going on here, is that you know when you're you know, so so these these are like links, right? If I if my model create if my model predicts an open bracket and open bracket, what that means is that very soon it's going to have to output the close bracket close bracket, right? But if I'm only dealing with let's say an n-gram model. Once I get to something like here, I've basically forgotten that I'm in a bracket, right? So, so, so that's the whole point of the HTs is that the H's sort of should be storing that information, right? The H should be saying while I'm in this, hey, don't forget, I need to, I'm in a bracket and you know, very soon I should be out of it. So at some point, I'm going to, I want you to output the uh, close bracket. Right. So remember, this is character level. So it's, you know, so word level is it, it's not as cool. But with character level here, you know, I, you know, it is capturing a little bit more uh, dependencies. Right. OK, so. I think the, the better examples are going to be uh, these ones next, um, and they're we're going to go we'll sort of work through a, a few of them. Um, they look a little bit crazy but it's not particularly complicated. Um, essentially what we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at those, those hidden components. So you know, we can think of them as those hidden neurons. Um, um, oh, also caveat, this actually was run not on a recurrent neural network, but the LSTMs, which we may have time to talk about, but it's the same philosophy, so like you know, don't be too upset about that. Um, okay, so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at basically you know we're going to pick a few of these neurons and sort of see how actually you know they fire depending on where you are in your uh, in your sequence. Okay. And so, you know, in this particular case, uh, we actually have 512 is the size of our um, is the size of our hidden layer, and we actually have three 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 of these layers. So, you know, this is a really huge recurrent neural network. Well, not not that big, but it's a pretty big recurrent neural network. We have 512 neurons per layer, so that's a lot of you know information you could be storing while you're actually running through this. Okay. So let's look at this example, right? So this is a example where we're basically trying to 
Um, well, so in this particular case, we're looking at uh, data and we're looking in particular at the neuron that we think is gonna be related to uh, generating URLs, right? So, 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 you, so you think, you know, so what we're doing is, okay, Wikipedia is the example here, right? And we want to basically be really good at predicting the characters, right? And obviously in Wikipedia, you have URLs all the time, right? So what you would hope is that in a few of the slots where you have your hidden, you have your hidden variables, you want something to sort of capture, you know, potentially where you are in your, you know, when you're forming a URL, maybe you want something to capture, okay, this remembers the structure of the, the URL, right? So let's look at what's going on here. Okay, so here, this is this, um, in this particular case, what the, uh, what this new one is, is that it's something that basically gets excited when you're in a URL, like, you know, in your character model, this is basically when you're inside a URL, this is gonna be firing, right? So, you know, if you look at this example here, you know, this is the start of www dot. So basically it looks like, you know, when you're, when you, when you're at a www dot, then this neuron is gonna start firing, right? And then sometimes it's a little bit complicated to tell, but, you know, usually it's like an OM, then that basically suggests that it's gonna stop. Um, firing, right? So, you know, basically this hidden neuron is basically capturing the presence of whether, whether or not you're inside a URL, right? And clearly your output should depend on whether or not you're in a URL, right? Because if you, if you know you're in a URL, then usually, especially if you're in the beginning of a URL, you know it's gonna be www dot, uh, and then it usually ends up with, ends in a dot com or dot, Gov or whatever, right? So here we're sort of seeing that these hidden units are capturing something about, you know, what's the local context of the characters, right? So here's another one. So this is the example that we had before where we're looking at um, sort of these brackets, right? So as I was saying here, this one is, I guess, oh, colors, uh, sorry, yeah. So what are the colors? Well, so they would say it here, but um, essentially the colors here are, the, the, the things that I'm looking at are sort of the greens. The green basically means my neuron is firing, which basically means the value of them are high. Uh, and then the blues are when they're not firing or when they're low, but in this particular case, we don't, care too much about it. It's mainly when they're firing. Um, then the other ones correspond to the probabilities of the, the next of the word. Um, but yeah, so, well. Um, the other ones correspond to how confident you are about those words. So if you're, for instance, if you're in this position here, what, you know, so, so yeah, you're at an eight, you're at a TT, sorry. You're at a TTP colon slash slash, because this is such a you know, standard pattern, then your model is very, very confident about the next uh, thing it's gonna predict, All right? So it should basically predict uh, this, then it obviously does that, predicts this, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, it's pretty confident it's a www dot, but then obviously the next, this, the next word is a pretty hard, a hard letter because obviously you don't know what is after www dot. It predicts B, I guess, but actually turns out it's gonna be a Y. Um, so the colors there represent the, uh, the, the probabilities you assign for the multinomial for the recurrent network. 
And, and this is for a particular choice of a, a neuron in my hidden layer. So this is one of the elements of my hidden layer. Um, so we have, you know, we, we just ran like, so we basically pick one of the hidden layers that we think actually does something interesting. What corresponds to a neuron in the one layer recon neural network? So what I'm saying is basically one of the entries of my HT. So, so you know, each HT, HT is a vector of, you know, of H, of, of size H. So one of those corresponds to a neuron. Okay. So, I mean, so the point, the, the point of all this is really just to say, when I'm making predictions about the next character, I, you know, what kinds of information, what kinds of pieces of data do I need to be able to do that task well, right? So this is where the hidden layers comes in. Like that sort of what's the pieces of information in my hidden layer should I be storing such that I can do this task well, right? So in this particular example, if I'm, so th this is a markdown environment, right? So ideally, one of the pieces of information I should be using is that whether or not whether or not I'm inside this environment should be important to me because if I'm inside this environment, then that means at some point I will need to close my uh, my bars, right? So I, you know, I, I don't I don't want to close them immediately, right? But at some point I'm going to close the, uh, you know, this environment, right? So, so what you can see is, you know, sometimes he's going to guess that it's actually going to close, right? So, you know, usually what's going to happen is you, you, you're not going to guess in the beginning that it closes, but eventually you're going to start to guess that it closes. Um, and then at that point, you know, you're actually pretty sh certain that it's going to close because you finished like a word, right? So that's sort of what these hidden layers, what the hidden neurons were basically the, the values of them are trying to represent. They're trying to represent something about the context that you're in, right? And so, you know, ideally this is basically some form of memorization, right? This is saying, okay, this hidden neuron is re remembering that I'm in a mar uh, markdown environment and I need to be out of it soon, right? This one is remembering that I'm in a URL, right? So you have, some very, very similar things here, right? Um, so this is now, <laughs> now blue corresponds to turning on, which is uh, you know, a bit annoying. But here, these, uh, these neurons are turning on when you're inside quotation marks, right? So this is just basically some type of memorization. Right? It's some type of memory that you're incorporating into your, into your sequence models, right? Because otherwise, you don't know, you can't create things that work well, right? The actual like extreme version of this is like, if you actually do things like write code, right? Because code actually has a very fixed structure that actually, you know, requires, you know, open brackets, close brackets, everything needs, needs to be perfect. So code is very dependent on its context, right? And so here you can see in the same way, you can actually set up, set up you know, your LSTM slash recurring neural networks to actually create code that actually you know, is, is runnable. And it's only able to do this because it's able to remember you know, where in your function you are, right? So in this particular case, oh, huh, sorry. Um, actually, yeah, in this particular case, it looks like, I guess I got confused with the color. Uh, so I guess sometimes the color means one thing, sometimes the color means the other thing. 
Um, at least in this case, the the red signifies that you're sort of within an if statement, um, like inside the actual if statement. Uh, then blue signifies you're sort of within the the the, the chunk of the the code itself. Um, anyway, yeah. So, what is the point of all this? The point of all this is that you set up. Whoopsies. Uh oh. The point of all this is you set up this fairly innocuous recurrent neural network. It's it's just a neural network, right? It ends up just being you know, almost three lines of code or those three lines of code. Well, I mean, it ends up just being, whoa, wrong one. These three equations, right? Um, and just from these three equations, uh, you're able to get dependencies in the much the same way that we could have done with hidden Markov models, right? With hidden Markov models, you could, you could get dependencies because the, um, because the, uh, the XTs, the hidden variables, they were random. And so they depend on each other. And so the final data is gonna be dependent on one another, right? Here we don't have, here the HTs aren't random, but because everything sort of depends on each other, um, as a result, you get sort of these long-term dependencies that allow you to create sequences, handle sequences that are much more elaborate than with something as you know, silly like a, and RAM model. Okay. Um, hmm. So I, you know, I don't really have time to talk about LSTMs. Um, I sort of want to talk about um, the sequence to sequence stuff that I was just talking about a little bit. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Uh, well, I guess, you know, we can just end early for once. Uh, well, okay, no. <laughs> this is not. This is actually probably just to make things even more confusing, but I want to look at just this for a little bit. So this, this, this is um, this is a pretty common architecture. It's called sequence to sequence. Um, and so, really, what's what's going to happen is I'm going to actually have my input data, right? So this is like my English phrase, say. So this is like x1, x2, x3. And then this creates h1, h2, h3, right? So so what, what's happening is I actually don't have, you know, I don't actually have my output, like y1 here, right? So I, I don't have this. All I have is the H1, which then feeds into my H2, and then my X2 feeds into my H2, which then feeds into my X H3, and also X3 feeds into H3, right? So you're basically getting rid of that final step where you have your Y. Um, I mean, okay, you can also have Y here, but it's not, you don't actually use it, so, so it's not very important. But the key point is that how, how do these sequence to sequence models work? is that basically they're going to take your input, right? This is some in, in English phrase, so you know, like three, three words, like, you know, this is good, for instance, right? The output of this is going to be basically H3, All right? So this is sort of the output, right? So there's actually the, the hidden the, the hidden layer of the final word, the hidden uh, layer of the final word, yeah. Um, and so one way you can think about this, and we, we don't we don't really have time to sort of talk about this concept. So this is sort of known as an encoder. Um, and so 
intuitively, what, what, what you're trying to do is that you have this sentence, right? And you basically want to, you know, represent this sentence as a fixed length vector. In this particular case, my fixed length vector is H3, right? So I have this sentence, you know, hopefully you want your sentences to be short, which is why, you know, this works nicely for like, you know, when you're doing translations, you usually just ask a short sentence. So you basically want to represent this sentence as a vector. And the recurring neural network allows you to do this because basically what's going to happen is, yeah, your H3 is going to be learning from all these words, right? So it's like accumulation of knowledge and the output of that is H3, right? So, you know, this is this is basically a recurring neural network, except I don't have the top part with the, the, the Y1, blah, 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 but it's basically the same thing. And then what I do is from this output, I can then do the whole one to many thing, right? So I have now my, you know, I'm just gonna call it, yeah, that's H3. This goes to H4. Well, no, that's not right. Draw it, draw it like that. So now H3 is like my input. This goes to like H dash one, which goes to H dash two, which goes to H dash three. And these create my Y1s. These create my Y2s. Y three and, and you know this this can this this can go on right so this could be H four Y four right so this step here well so this is called a decoder but basically this is the same thing as the you know the image to caption step right so what I'm doing is I'm taking an input here this is the representation that I had for the sentence. I'm going to then create my output, which is, you know, the Chinese version of it, say. Right. So this is sort of capturing the, you know, the various ways you can sort of add these things together to get actually really interesting architectures that can handle very different types of data. Um, yeah. So, you know, I haven't talked about actually how you solve these, how do you actually compute these? Um, we will get to that next week when we talk about you know, fundamental neural networks. Um, so far, it's just been intuition about like these architectures and sort of how you can sort of mix and match them to uh, you know, handle interesting types of data. Cool, sorry for going over again. Any questions otherwise, uh, ciao.